Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Sandesh Gulhani. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will confirm whether WhatsApp messaging by the Health Secretary and his ministers are covered by freedom of information legislation and the processes that are in place to archive these to prevent them from being inadvertently lost or otherwise deleted. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Dr Gulhani for his question. All recorded information held by ministers or officials uh, which relates to the business of Scottish Government is subject to freedom of information law, irrespective of its format or the platform in which it is held. The Scottish Government has a robust information management policy in place which governs how we retain documents of, of, of record for government business. The policy covers any exchanges on WhatsApp or indeed any form of div digital communication and that government ministers undertake. Any policy or business discussions must be transcribed or copied into an email or text document using the Scots platform and stored in the central corporate record. Sandesh Gohani. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. Given the First Minister had no minutes of her meetings regarding ferries, uh, Cabinet Secretary potentially conducting ministerial business over text, we are obviously concerned uh, that there is no paper trail and things are hiding. Given your answer, um, but we do feel business should be conducted on government emails or by official correspondence. We are concerned that we keep seeing Secret Scotland under this SNP Green Government. Will, you, will the Scottish Government commit to releasing all WhatsApp messaging where any personal messages are redacted by an independent party? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. <laughs> I, 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 perhaps it will be helpful for Dr Gulhani if I explain the process again, because I feel I probably didn't, from his supplementary question, articulate the situation, because substantive government business and communication between ministers and official is normally conducted using email and the Scots IT platform. The Scottish Government policy is clear that staff and ministers using any digital platform have responsibility to consider issues such as security and GDPR compliance. Mobile messaging apps can be a useful tool but there is a clear expectation that any information which relates to the substance of government decision making should be transposed to the official record and retained. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question number two, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Sir, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the financial health of businesses and the viability of projects prior to the award of a grant of public funds. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government has extensive guidance and process established and available to Scottish Government staff to ensure adequate due diligence is conducted around all organisations <coughs> who receive public funds via public sector grants. This guidance also requires all projects to be assessed for viability via business cases to ensure the, regular, the regular proprietary and value for money principles of the Scottish Government are adhered to. Public bodies are also expected to observe the guidance within the Scottish Public Finance Manual in relation to grants and adhere to the principles of value for money, regularity and propriety. Murdo Fraser. Can I thank the uh, Minister for his uh, response? In September, the company Recycling Technologies went into administration with £22.8 million pounds in liabilities and just £1 million pound in assets. This company was given a grant of 1.7 million of taxpayers' funds by Zero Waste Scotland in 2018. But according to Companies House, accounts for the company lodged on the 11th of October 2017 raised concerns about the ability of the company at that point to continue as a going concern. So why, therefore, was this grant of 1.7 million pounds of taxpayers' money paid to a company where there were concerns about its ongoing viability, will any of this money now be recovered to the taxpayer? And what lessons have been learned from this sorry episode? Minister. Um, as, as I already indicated, um, there are processes and procedures in place uh, within the Scottish Public Finance Manual in relation to grants and uh, those adhere to the principles of value for money, regulatory and propriety. 
Um, if the member had been serious about getting an answer to that specific question, he would have let me know in advance, as I could have come prepared with the answer to it. Of course, he doesn't expect me to know the ins and outs of every single company that's been awarded a grant. If he seriously wants an answer to that, please, uh, I'll, I'll take that on board. Go um, find out the information and reply back to him on the specifics in regard to that, uh, that particular business and the situation that, uh, that applied and why that grant was made and the background work that was done to check uh, those, uh, the, 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 the business case within the principles I've just outlined. Willie Rennie. Um, the recent Audit Scotland report on the consolidated accounts was quite revealing. The Scottish Government wasted £50 million of public funds in return for zero jobs at Bifab. If the Government had its time again, would it make the same decision about Bifab? Minister. Uh, of course, when you go into any situation, you're not sure what the outcome is going to be. That's the, the whole point. That's why the public sector steps in, because if it was that easy and that clear-cut a win, then obviously the, the private sector would be, would be investing and there would be no need for public sector uh, involvement. The public sector get involved where so we think there is a case, where we think public money can be... Uh, used adequately to support an economic, uh, an economic outcome, where there's a strategic intent that's, uh, that's important to Scotland's economy to be pursued, and of course um, pers uh, doing so within the bounds of the, uh, the, the, the public sector uh, finance manual and the other, um, other uh, regulations and uh, uh, business case requirements that are in place. Uh, we are not going to uh, go through all of these scenarios and uh, come out the other end with them being financially successful. That is uh, absolutely and obviously the case. Um, but it is not uh, that this government is, uh, is not going to be in a position where we're not going to intervene for fear of failure. We will win some, we will lose some. That's what it's all about. It's important that we intervene where it, uh, we, we think that the, the numbers make sense. Um, but, of course, the outcome is, uh, is not guaranteed in any scenario. Question number three, Co-Cap Stewart. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will give an update on the next steps for the National Convention uh, conversation to inform a new dementia strategy which closed to responses on the 5th of December. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm grateful to all those organisations and individuals who have taken the time to input into our national conversation. We have heard the priorities of people living with dementia, their families and carers and individuals and organisations interested in dementia policy. Final engagement events are continuing throughout this week. We will take these responses and working with our National Dementia Lived Experience Panel, Strategic Advisory Group and other key stakeholders develop an outcomes focused strategy with publication planned for spring of 2023. Co-Cap Stewart. I, I um, thank Kevin Stewart for that answer. The discovery of the breakthrough drug uh, Lacan Emab is exceptionally welcome news and offers real hope for Alzheimer's sufferers and their families. Uh, Professor Tara Spires Jones and the research team at Edinburgh University are to be congratulated on this development. But this morning, I would just like to ask um, if you're familiar with childhood dementia, a condition caused by more than uh, 70 individual genetic disorders that together account for almost as many deaths as, uh, in children as cancer. Um, there is no cure and there are very few treatments that can even slow it down. Um, will Kevin Stewart commit to take uh, cognizance of this devastating but little known condition when developing the new dementia strategy? Minister. Um, I thank Cocab Stewart for raising this very important issue, President Officer. Uh, childhood dementia is a term which is sometimes used to describe a very rare group of neurodegenerative disorders uh, that require referral for specialist paediatric assessment and then care within specialist neurodegenerative disorder services is required. Um, the NHS will always continue to use the best international clinical evidence and research to inform best practice. Uh, and I'm grateful to the member for raising awareness of this very important issue in the Chamber today. Question number four, Alec Trowley. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making on addressing the reported care staff retention and recruitment challenge within social care. Minister Kevin Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government acknowledged the pressures faced by the social care sector at present, and to address these, we plan to launch an adult social care recruitment campaign uh, in January of next year. Approved, we've approved funding for My Job Scotland recruitment website to enable all organisations to advertise uh, vacancies free of charge. We continue to push the UK Government for improved mitigation, migration system, and working with stakeholders are developing resources resources and support to recruit international workers. We also plan to host further job fairs with DWP across Scotland uh, and we continue to work with employability partners and the SSSC to deliver career events targeting young people. Alex Rowley. President officer, the fundamental issue at the heart of the retention and recruitment issues that we have is the gap between what care workers are paid in the private sector and care workers are paid in the public sector. In the private sector, it is low pay, poor terms and poor conditions that have got workers walking out of that sector and making it more difficult. All, work, all, all care is paid for by this government. Does he agree that that is a fundamental issue? And if he does, why is he not addressing it unless we address the poor pay, poor terms and poor conditions of care workers working in the private sector, paid for by the public sector? We will not address this problem. Minister. Uh, President officer, the government uh, recognises uh, the pay and conditions issues uh, in the care sector, and that's why this government has given not one, but two pay, uh, pay rises to adult social carers here in Scotland in the past year. Uh, and we are looking uh, to see what more we can do uh, on that front. I would highlight to Mr Rowley and to the Chamber uh, that adult social care workers here in Scotland are paid much more than those in Labour-controlled Wales or Tory-controlled England. Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer to Scottish Government commissioned research entitled, Quotes, Contribution of EU Workers to Social Care 2022, published in August. Further to the findings, does the Minister agree with me that while accepting COVID has had its impact, Brexit has made recruitment and retention of EU workers worse? Uh, I completely uh, agree with Christine Graham. Uh, the sector is deeply concerned about the impact uh, that the post-EU exit loss of freedom of movement is having on, on recruitment uh, or to critical frontline uh, social care roles. UK government immigration policy fails to address Scotland's distinct demographic and economic needs and completely disregards key sectors that we have relied upon during the health pandemic, including social care. We believe that Scotland's social care services benefit greatly from the staff who joined the workforce through international recruitment. I wish that we had control over immigration policy here so that we didn't have the situation where some services have lost loads and loads of staff with one service that I talked to losing 40% of their workforce because of Brexit. That's not good enough. Question number five, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest assessment is of the potential impacts of the United Kingdom Internal Market Act 2020 and the Subsidy Control Act 2022 on future agricultural support schemes in areas such as Argyle and Butte. Cabinet Secretary Mary Gujal. <clears throat> Our farmers and crofters face challenges which aren't found elsewhere in the UK, so we've tailored our current agricultural support to help address this, for example, through schemes such as less favoured area support. The deeply damaging UK Internal Market Act, which was imposed on Scotland without our consent, allowed UK ministers to introduce the Subsidy Control Act. We do have serious concerns about this, not least because the principles that are set out in Schedule 1 of that Act risk constraining our ability to tailor support to the specific needs of Scottish farmers and crofters in the future. Jenny Minto. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In Argyll and Butte in 2021, 739 businesses received LFAS payments. These provide vital investment to hill farmers and crofters who are a crucial part of our agricultural sector. 
the NFUS has noted that 97% of the Scottish Government's budget for agricultural schemes are derived from Westminster. The legislation I mentioned has left the door open to future policy decisions which threaten the ability of the Scottish Government to offer the focused support of this nature. So may I ask the Cabinet Secretary what she would say to hill farmers and crofters I represent who are concerned that the Tory Government in Westminster would be prepared to sacrifice necessary support like Elfas in pursuit of their mission of under undermining devolution. Cabinet Secretary. I would absolutely agree that this UK legislation could threaten our ability to support farmers and crofters in constituencies such as the members through vital schemes such as ELFAS. Now we are committed to maintaining that support for those farming and stewarding the land in our most challenging areas. However, of course, that will, will depend on getting that certainty of UK government funding um, and the guarantees being honoured going forward. Because EU exit means that we no longer have that long-term certainty of funding and the unilateral choices that are being imposed by the Treasury provide insufficient replacement EU budget. Now we've been really clear and consistent in our position that we do expect full replacement of EU funds to ensure that we don't see any detriment to our finances and we expect the UK Government to fully respect the devolution settlement in any future arrangement. But as it stands at the moment I have no clarity in terms of future budget and we know that we're already facing a Briefly, shortfall please. of £93 million pounds because those guarantees haven't been honoured. Let's have more succinct questions and responses, please. Question number six, Michael Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the reported delays to the development of the Swallow Roundabout in Dundee. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Scotland is working with representatives of the developer on a minute of agreement, which will provide Scottish Ministers consent to make changes to the A90 trunk road in the vicinity of the Swallow Roundabout in Dundee. This work is not straightforward, but every effort is being made to bring matters to a conclusion. Michael Mara. I thank the Minister for that answer. Residents in the Western Gateway of Dundee have been waiting for more than seven years for these vital upgrade works on the Swallow Roundabout. At long last, that minute of agreement the Minister refers to is sitting on the, a desk at Transport Scotland. Can the Minister say when the agreement will be signed and what more can the Minister do to lock down a timetable for these vital safety measures? Minister. I know Mr Mara takes a very keen interest in this issue and I know that he's been in correspondence previously with Transport Scotland on this matter. Of course, delivery of the improvements needed is a requirement of planning and the developer is obligated to deliver junction improvements at the Swallow Roundabout. That's going to address the impact of the development on the trunk road network, of course, for which Scottish ministers have responsibility. I have discussed this matter with my officials in Transport Scotland. They advise they are in regular contact with the developer on this matter and they will continue to work constructively with Springfield Properties to progress the outstanding issues. This includes, of course, the completion of the minute of agreement as soon as possible. But in the interim, I am, of course, happy to have my officials meet with Mr Mara and interested parties to ensure progress on this issue. I recognise, as he has mentioned, this has been going on for a number of years and there is a need for the local community to have that timetable. Thank you. Question number seven, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, with regard to flooding, what engagement it has had with the UK Government to explore the great risk transfer as described in the recent David Hume Institute report? Minister Mary McCallum. Presiding Officer, the DHI report explores risk and where it falls between the individual and institutions. The report highlights flood re, a reinsurance scheme to help people access affordable flood insurance, and it highlights it as a best practice example of how institutions can underwrite risks that are not realistically within individuals' control. And that's currently benefiting 16,500 people, uh, pro sorry, properties in Scotland. Uh, Floodry also supports the Build Back Better approach, whereby homeowners install property flood resilience measures when repairing their properties after a flood, ensuring they are better prepared. And the Scottish Government is working with, UK, uh, with governments across the UK to ensure that flood insurance remains widely available and affordable. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the Minister for her response. With several areas of Scotland, including my constituency of Aberdeen South and North Kincardine, now at increased risk, uh, as the Minister uh, referenced, the flood risk scheme offers some hope to householders. However, too few people are aware of the scheme uh, and it excludes properties built since 2009. So can I ask what steps are the Scottish Government taking to publicise the scheme and ensure homeowners are aware of the possibility of affordable insurance through the flood re scheme. Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. We will uh, continue to work with flood re, the insurance industry, 
and others to promote flood insurance. And we've, we've funded the Scottish Flood Forum since 2009, and they work with communities and advise about property flood resilience and insurance issues like flood re. Uh, and I'm always happy to uh, work with the member, happy for her to speak to me about any ways that we can ensure her constituents know that they have uh, access to this support. Um, the majority of homes in high flood risk areas will be eligible for flood re. Properties built since the 1st of January 2009 aren't covered, but that's because it's important not to incentivise home building in flood risk areas. Um, Scottish planning policy, it takes a precautionary approach to ensure that new properties are built out with areas of significant flood risk. And of course, uh, included in the revised draft MPF4 is updated policy on flood risk, which aims to strengthen resilience to flood risk and reduce the vulnerability of existing and future development. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this week's health stats show that almost two in three patients attending accident and emergency at Glasgow's Queen Elizabeth University Hospital were not seen within the target time. In just one week, more than a thousand people at the Queen Elizabeth alone were not treated within four, years, eh, four hours. All over Scotland, the number of people waiting beyond the target time was over 9,500. It is the worst ever performance in Scotland's a &E departments. So what specific actions is the First Minister taking to prevent people waiting hours on end at accident and emergency departments over Christmas? First Minister. Firstly, presenting officer, specifically in relation to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow, obviously it faces the same challenges as other hospital sites uh, do, and the performance there, as it is in hospitals across Scotland, is not where uh, we want it to be, and certainly not where patients uh, have a right to expect it to be. That said, the most recent statistics show that performance at the Queen Elizabeth it had improved. Uh, however, we know performance will fluctuate, um, and indeed for the national picture as well as for individual sites, uh, the monthly figures give a, a clearer depiction of uh, performance. Uh, in terms of the Queen Elizabeth specifically, through the overall uh, unscheduled care collaborative, uh, that hospital has a range of actions underway, including opening additional wards on site, uh, reconfiguring their surgical and medical capacity balance. Uh, they are also uh, working to improve performance in the minor injuries uh, flow for patients who need care but not necessarily admission to hospital. And uh, they are optimising their discharge process by rolling out discharge without delay with the potential uh, to see an additional two to three discharges per ward per day. So there is intensive work underway at that hospital. And indeed that reflects some of the work that is underway way across Scotland. Uh, these, uh, this situation, of course, uh, is of concern to me, to the government, and we're working hard to address it, supporting the health service. Of course, it is not unique to Scotland. We are seeing the same pressures in health services uh, in all parts of the UK and indeed further afield, uh, but we will continue to take the steps uh, to support the NHS to address these issues here in Scotland. Douglas Ross. I, I know that the First Minister was focusing on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is what I was asking about, but I was also saying these are the worst statistics on record for A&E departments across Scotland. And I think people watching this would like to hear what the First Minister plans to do across Scotland at this critical period we're leading up to over at the Christmas holidays. But let's look at other departments within our hospitals beyond A&E, because the First Minister it did mention discharges. The number of beds occupied because of delayed discharge is also at its worst ever level. In the most recent month of data, 1,900 beds every single day were taken up at Scotland's hospitals by patients who had medically been cleared to leave. They could safely go home, but instead they are occupying beds. First Minister, if the Scottish Government had kept its promise to end delayed discharge, wouldn't we have 1,900 extra beds to treat patients right now? First Minister. Well, 
Firstly, uh, President Officer, I want to, uh, as quickly as I can, go through uh, all of these points. Firstly, yes, I did concentrate on the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in my previous answer uh, for the simple reason uh, Douglas Ross asked me about the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. However, I also referred to the Urgent and Unscheduled Care Collaborative. That is a national initiative. It's backed by £50 million of investment that is supporting the implementation across Scotland uh, of a range of measures to uh, drive down weights in our accident and emergency units. And they include uh, offering where appropriate alternatives to hospitals, such as hospital at home, uh, directing people to more appropriate urgent care settings, scheduling urgent appointments to avoid long waits in accident emergencies. So the examples I gave in relation to the Queen Elizabeth, as I said, uh, reflect that wider national work. Uh, I also made the point, and I think it is uh, worth uh, repeating this point, that while these are very serious issues in Scotland that this government is extremely focused on addressing, they are not unique to Scotland. If you look at the situation in England right now, more than 10% uh, of patients going to E&E are waiting over 12 hours. Uh, so this is an issue that health services across the UK and much of the world uh, are facing right now and we continue to focus on them. Turning briefly to delayed uh, discharges, uh, of course, again, this is a problem replicated across uh, all health services uh, in the UK right now. Uh, of course, not all uh, delays are in the acute sector. And it's important to point out that uh, in terms of the most recent year for which we have data, 97% of all patients are discharged without delay. Uh, but we are taking significant steps, working with health boards and integrated joint boards to target investment this year. Uh, so that includes investment to enhance care at home, to increase the hourly rate of pay for those who work in social care, uh, to support interim care arrangements and investment to enhance multidisciplinary teams. There is a Briefly, ministerial First Minister. assurance uh, I will be as brief as possible. This is important stuff, well, Presiding done. Officer. Serious questions have been asked and I'm seeking, I'm seeking to give detailed answers. The final point I want to make is that a ministerial... I would have thought, having raised these really serious yeah, issues, the, the Conservatives would actually want the information that answers the questions. Even if they don't, I suspect people watching at home do. Final Briefly. point is that we have established a ministerial assurance group to provide advice on the deployment of options that support the resilience of the health and social care system in response to winter pressures. That group is currently meeting weekly. Good. Douglas Ross. Well, I, I think the concerns from these benches were the First Minister apparently disrespecting the presiding officer, who is asking, who is asking to focus on the issues. And, and perhaps, perhaps the First Minister would have more time to focus on the issues about the questions on Scotland's NHS if she didn't try uh, to uh, throw the blame elsewhere around the United Kingdom. Because the unique issue here is Nicola Sturgeon and her government are in sole control of the NHS here in Scotland. So I've asked about the problems in our A&E. I've asked about the issues with delayed discharge. So let's look at another issue that is happening in a part of our NHS where patients are really struggling to get treatment, our GP practices. This week, Dr Andrew Buist of BMA Scotland said this. These are his words. My real fear is we are at a tipping point and what we're going to see is areas of Scotland that are under-doctored. He continues, and that is more likely to happen in areas of higher deprivation and the care of these patients is going to suffer. First Minister, are doctors right that if you're poorer, you'll receive a second-rate healthcare service in Scotland's NHS? First Minister. Uh, a great deal of what this government does in the health service and more generally, of course, is designed to tackle and address inequalities, not least the steps we are taking through our social security system yeah. uh, to lift people out of poverty uh, and indeed to mitigate the actions of a Tory government at Westminster that is pushing so many more people yes. into yeah. poverty. But on the NHS, uh, presiding officer, I was giving, uh, as I think is right and proper, uh, details detailed information about the actions this government is taking to address challenges that our NHS is facing. I was making the point, and I think it is an important point to make, uh, that these challenges are not unique uh, to Scotland. Uh, they're not even unique to the United Kingdom right now. But if Douglas Ross wants to say this is all specifically about this SNP government, then, then, then okay. 
Notwithstanding the challenges that our NHS is facing, a and &E units in Scotland are the best performing yeah. anywhere in the UK. Yeah. Delayed, discharges, <laughs> delayed discharges, while far too high, are lower than they are in England uh, and Wales. And on, and on GPs, which I'm going, to, I'm going to come on to the question about GPs, there are more headcount GPs per 100,000 population in Scotland than the rest of the UK by some considerable distance. So if Douglas Ross is saying uh, that the challenges in our health service are all about the SNP, then he has to recognise the relative performance of our NHS compared to other parts of the UK. On GPs, uh, again, we are working to increase the numbers in our National Health Service. We have record numbers across uh, many different clinical areas uh, already in our health service. We are working to increase the number of GPs. Uh, we've already increased headcount by uh, 277, and that positive progress working with the GP profession will continue. And of course, uh, we are recruiting and supporting the recruitment uh, of other professionals to support multidisciplinary teams in primary care. Final point I would make, presiding, presiding officer, is this. Uh, it is easy um, and it is entirely legitimate in uh, this session or any session of First Minister's questions to state the problems in our National Health Service. Uh, but the job of government is to take the actions to support the NHS to address these issues. And that is the responsibility that the people of Scotland trust this government to do. Douglas Ross. I think it's shameful that the First Minister dedicates more of her time attacking the NHS in other parts of the United Kingdom than focusing on what she can do here in Scotland. Because it is absolutely clear that more has to be done to tackle the crisis in Scotland's NHS. There's a crisis in our A&E departments. There's a crisis with delayed discharges. There's a crisis at GP practices. And all of this adds up to health care that doesn't deliver for patients. For cancer patients, the situation can then be between life and death. We've received a freedom of information response from a Scottish Health Board on this issue. It reveals that a patient has waited more than six months to start treatment for breast cancer. Another patient has waited 18 months to start treatment for prostate cancer. And worst of all, Someone has waited two years, two years to start their treatment for cancer. First Minister, that is not good enough. Lives are at risk. The longer someone waits to start treatment for cancer, the less likely they are to beat cancer. So what action will the First Minister and her government take to tackle these appalling waiting times? First Minister. Well, firstly, President Officer, there are few areas of uh, the NHS more important uh, than cancer care uh, for the reasons that, that Douglas Ross has set out. Um, and obviously he cited individual cases. As always, uh, I am very willing to look at uh, the particular circumstances of individual cases. But it remains the case, uh, even with all of the challenges of the pandemic, that the median waiting time for a patient with cancer to start treatment uh, once uh, a decision to treat has been made is measured in days, yeah. uh, not weeks, uh, and certainly not months. Uh, well, the, it is, I'm, I'm trying to answer serious questions in a detailed uh, fashion, presiding officer. What I started saying is there will be individual cases, uh, sometimes where the clinical circumstances mean that it takes longer, and sometimes, yes, uh, where failings in the NHS mean that it takes longer. The point I am making is for the vast majority of patients that is not the case, and the median waiting time to start cancer treatment is measured in days in this country, uh, and that is down to the hard work of those on the front line. Now, presiding officer, uh, I think Douglas Ross started his last question by saying I spent more time attacking the health service elsewhere than I did talking about the Scottish uh, Health Service. Uh, a, I've not attacked the Health Service anywhere. Secondly, I think anybody reviewing the official report uh, of this session will see that that is just factually inaccurate. In fact, the Conservatives were getting impatient because uh, they seemed to think I was taking too long going into detail about the unscheduled care collaborative earlier on. But when, when Douglas Ross 
puts it to me that the problems in our National Health Service are unique to Scotland and they are worse in Scotland because of this government. It is reasonable for me to point out that that is not the case. Thank you. That despite the challenges that nobody here is shying away from, our NHS performs better than its counterparts in England and Wales. And the only reason I'm saying that is because Douglas Ross is putting the counter to me. Finally, presiding officer, it is really important that we continue to support record investment in our National Health Service. It is not that long ago, and here we are measuring in weeks, uh, not that long ago that Douglas Ross was demanding uh, that I cut taxes for the richest people in our country. Had I followed his advice, we'd have had to take investment out of our National Health Service, which is why few people will take Douglas Ross or the Conservatives seriously when it comes to trust on the National Health Service. Question at number two, Anna Sarwa. President Officer, child and adolescent mental health services are in crisis and they have been since long before the pandemic. Uh, too many children and young people are having referrals rejected and too many are waiting too long for treatment. Uh, does the First Minister know how many referrals to CAMS have been rejected in the past year and how many children have waited more than a year for their first appointment? First Minister. Um, I'm certainly very happy to uh, give the precise uh, figures uh, to Anna Sarwar uh, later on uh, rejected referrals. However, um, while there are challenges in children and adolescent mental health services, as there are, and I've just been reflecting, across the National Health Service, uh, we have in uh, recent uh, months been seeing some very positive changes in waiting lists, actually the most positive changes uh, for over half a decade. So the overall CAMS waiting list has uh, decreased in the latest quarter uh, by 1,398 children since uh, the previous quarter. Children waiting over 18 weeks uh, have decreased by 658 since the previous quarter and children waiting over 52 weeks uh, have decreased by 281. And actually, uh, that marks the first time that there has been a decrease in all three waiting lists since September 2016. So there's significant work still to do, not least to continue our progress in community uh, mental health services for children and young people. But there is progress being made, particularly to tackle the longest waits, and I think that is something that should be welcomed. Anna Sarwar. Uh, 8,873 children and young people have had their referrals to CAMS rejected in the past year. 8,873. 1,248 had now been waiting more than a year for their first appointment. And the First Minister quotes statistics on those who have had their first appointment, but even those who have had a first appointment are still not getting the treatment they need. And here is just one example. Charlie is a primary seven pupil. He was referred to CAMS in January 2020. In April 2020, he had a video consultation with a doctor from CAMS, so would have dropped off the list referred to by the First Minister. But this is the last time he heard from CAMS. He's had no diagnosis, and without treatment, Charlie has become withdrawn and doesn't like to spend time with other children. His mother found a video he had posted to TikTok where he asked if anyone felt like they wanted to die because they were so different. Charlie's mum told the CAMS service but they said it would make no difference to his waiting time. They told her that it could be another two years before Charlie receives the support he needs. This is not good enough. Charlie is not alone. There are thousands of children like him. First Minister, how have you let it get so bad? First Minister. Well, before I come on to the, the general uh, issue again, let me uh, say, obviously, Charlie's experience is not acceptable. I, I don't know all of the particular circumstances of, of Charlie's case. As always, when individual cases are raised, uh, I am willing uh, to look into those. Uh, it is the case uh, that uh, there are waits for child and adolescent mental health services that are too long, uh, but it is also the case that there is significant action being taken that is reducing already these long waits. And, and I Sarwar uh, just uh, well didn't respond to uh, the information I gave him in my uh, previous answer but it is really important nobody is uh, denying there is a significant issue here uh, but we are now seeing 
uh, decreases in the numbers of children waiting over 18 weeks, the numbers uh, waiting over uh, 52 weeks as well, and the overall uh, waiting list is also decreasing. So does that say there is not still a challenge? No, it doesn't. But it does say that the significant investment, the increase in the workforce, is now uh, having uh, an impact where we need to see it and we need to continue that. In terms of rejected referrals, uh, we have already accepted all of the recommendations in the audit of rejected referrals uh, that uh, was published in 2018 and we continue to act on them. One in every two referrals to CAMS is actually seen within 10 weeks um, and of course health boards have a duty to prioritise uh, those that need to be seen most uh, quickly and of obviously where any experience doesn't match that, we of course uh, have a duty to, to look into that and learn from it. Finally, Presiding Officer, we are also seeing um, a significant increase in those uh, who are accessing community uh, support for mental health services, which is a, an important part of that. Local authorities report uh, that in the first six months of this year, more than 38,000 children uh, accessed enhanced community-based mental health support services. And that is important so that we can ensure that those who need specialist services get it more quickly. Anna Sarwar. The first minister is just not listening. If you get a first appointment that is a telephone call, but your diagnosis doesn't happen and your treatment doesn't start, but you fall off a list, that's not a measure of success. That's a measure of failure and demonstrates you're gaming the system. This was a problem that is long before COVID. When Charlie's mother phoned CAMS, they said they were still waiting and working through cases from 2018. So that will be cases where they had the first appointment, but it will also be cases where treatment hasn't started and a diagnosis hasn't happened. And this government has never met its CAMS waiting time. And according to Public Health Scotland, a quarter of all deaths of 5 to 24-year-olds in our country are from suicide. A quarter. In the words of Charlie's mum, our children are being failed and no one is doing anything about it. But we can fix this. So will the First Minister first reverse the cuts to mental health in primary care, second guarantee funding for schools-based counselling, third commit to increasing the proportion of the NHS budget being spent on mental health so it reaches 11%, the same level as England and Wales, fourth create a new referral and triad system for mental health so that no one is rejected and finally record and publish the true waiting time from referral to diagnosis and the start of treatment so that no child like Charlie is left abandoned. First Minister. Presiding Officer, um, I'll say again uh, because it is important that experiences like Charlie's are not acceptable and I don't know all of the circumstances so I'm willing to look into that and I'm not standing here and saying Charlie will be the only young person far from it in the country that has that kind of experience uh, but nor is it right to say uh, that the progress I have narrated today is somehow unimportant because that is the progress that requires to be made to ensure that uh, there are far fewer experiences like uh, Charlie's. Uh, in terms of funding uh, under this government, mental health spending has almost uh, doubled uh, in cash terms uh, since we took office um, and we will continue uh, to support record uh, expenditure across our National Health Service and ensure appropriate expenditure for mental health services. Of course, as I said earlier on, uh, we are also shifting more treatment into the community. So one of the most important things that has been done, backed by investment, is the recruitment of counsellors across our secondary schools. These are really important issues. Uh, but issues again that uh, while it is right and proper to come to this chamber and state the challenge, our job as I have demonstrated today is to get on with the work of addressing these challenges. And as I have set out, uh, we've seen a fall in the waiting list for access to CAMS um, and that's down to the investment and the actions that are being taken and that's why it's so important that we continue with it. Thank you. I'll go to um, question number three and we'll take constituency and general supplementaries after question number six. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Can I advise the Chamber one of the matters that Cabinet will discuss on Tuesday is ongoing monitoring of the strep A uh, situation. Sadly, as we know, a number of children in England and Wales have died from invasive group A strep infections and our thoughts will be with 
their families. While increased levels of infection have been seen in Scotland, uh, current numbers are not particularly exceeding previous spikes uh, and we have had so far no deaths of children. Uh, however, a total of 13 uh, invasive Group A strep cases in children under 10 were reported to Public Health Scotland between the start of October and December the 5th. The uh, majority of these are mild, of course, and can be treated with penicillin. However, there is no room for complacency and we will continue to monitor the situation very closely. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that reply and I'm gratified to hear that the Cabinet will be discussing the Strep A outbreak. And can I ask that she comes back to Parliament before Christmas uh, with a statement on the progress on that issue? Uh, <laughs> Presiding Officer, what we've just heard from Anas Sarwar is devastating. Charlie is by no means alone, not by a long shot, and the situation is desperate. When Hamza Yusuf launched the NHS recovery plan last year, the mental health treatment target was missed for one in five children. It's now one in three. Young people are battling the long shadow of lockdown, anxiety and depression without support. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is trying to persuade this chamber of progress, but £38 million has just been cut from this year's mental health budget. That is money that could have been spent on cutting waiting times, training staff and putting more counsellors in our schools. That but that cut will lead to more delays. Presiding officer, you only get one childhood and waiting month after month after month for help can shatter those formative years. The NHS recovery plan promised the eradication of mental health waiting lists by March. That was always a bold target, but it is barely 100 days away and things are moving backwards. So can I ask the first minister, if that target is missed, will she continue to stand by this beleaguered health secretary? First minister. Well, Briefly, Presiding Officer, uh, mental health spending has uh, doubled under uh, this government. Um, that is uh, a fact. Uh, the number of people working in CAMS uh, has also doubled uh, under uh, this government, um, up by 110% uh, uh, to be precise. There are significant challenges in waiting times for CAMS and uh, we take that extremely seriously. Uh, but it is right uh, to point to progress because it is progress that that investment and the increase in the workforce is designed to achieve. So again, let me point out, we have seen a 14.4% decrease in the number of children and young people on the waiting list compared to the last quarter. Uh, we're seeing a decrease in the number waiting over 18 weeks uh, and the number waiting over 52 weeks. And as I said earlier on, that's the first time since 2016 that there's been a decrease in all three uh, waiting list measures. Does that mean we don't have more work to do? Of course it doesn't. There are significant challenges, uh, but there is real progress being made because of the actions, the focus and the determination of this government to support uh, the work of those on the front line and that will continue. Question number four, Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the rollout of the child disability payment. First Minister. Uh, we know that caring for a child who is disabled or has a long-term condition can result in extra costs from buying specialist equipment to taking part in activities. That's why child disability payment is a vital benefit that helps parents support their children to live their lives to the fullest possible. Um, I'm very pleased that in its first year, almost £60 million has been paid to the families of nearly 44,000 children and young people. Child disability payment is the first disability benefit anywhere in the UK where applicants are able to apply online, by phone, by post and face to face and this demonstrates our commitment to improving access to social security and ensuring people receive the assistance to which they are entitled. Paul McLennan. Thank you. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer. With increasing financial pressures on families in Scotland right now, it is even more important than ever that people get all the benefits they are entitled for. Can the First Minister therefore outline how our constituents can apply for child disability payment and check what extra financial support they might be entitled to from the Scottish Government? First Minister. Uh, well, it's important uh, that we do take steps to raise awareness of all of the help that is available and encourage as many people as possible who are eligible to apply for assistance. And as I said in my original answer, uh, for child, child disability uh, payment, applicants can apply online by phone, by post or face to face. I would encourage anyone who thinks they might be eligible for any uh, of our benefits to get in touch with Social Security Scotland staff are available to answer queries about benefits, help complete application forms 
uh, and of course there are local delivery officers available across the country so that this can be done face to face uh, where that is necessary. We are absolutely committed to making sure everyone gets the financial support they're entitled to uh, as shown through our benefit take up strategy. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. When setting up Social Security in Scotland, the Scottish Government said that one of the things it would do would be to get decisions right the first time round, recognising the distress that redeterminations can cause. Figures show that of redeterminations requested for child disability payment, 86% of cases the decision was not right the first time round. We were promised a fairer system here, so what can the First Minister do to address this issue and bring certainty to people who need Social Security that they won't need to jump through hoops to get it? First Minister. Well, fe feedback from app applications uh, where the first decision is not made correctly the first time is part of the process of making sure uh, that system is improved on an ongoing basis. Uh, and that is work I know uh, that Social Security Scotland uh, takes very seriously and focuses very hard on. Um, for all uh, the issues that she absolutely rightly brings to this chamber, um, about the operation of the social security system, particularly as it affects people with disabilities. I am absolutely certain uh, that Pam Duncan Glancy, and I hope I'm not wrong here, uh, would share my view that we do already have a fairer system in Scotland around these things than elsewhere in the UK. But we have an obligation through Social Security Scotland to continue to improve that experience so that A, people are getting all the help that they are entitled uh, to and secondly, they are getting that as easily as possible uh, and with as little bureaucracy as possible and where decisions are taken correctly in the first instance. Question number five, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how many single crewed ambulances responding to an emergency have been deployed in the last six months. First Minister. Between June and November this year, there were 1,429 instances when the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, single crewed ambulance shifts across Scotland. To put that in context, Presiding Officer, it represents 1.72% of the total number of shifts in that period. In addition to that, of course, there will be paramedic cars or motorbikes which are routinely uh, single crewed. Uh, these are used to support the ambulance service multi-vehicle response to serious incidents as well as being used by advanced paramedics to support patients with less serious conditions in the community. Uh, single crewed ambulance shifts only happen in exceptional circumstances uh, that can't be avoided, such as short notice staff absences or a significant uh, unforeseen increase in demand. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you uh, for that answer. That's really concerning because in simple terms, single crewed ambulances cannot transport patients to hospitals. In the Highlands, where journey times can be over two hours, this means there is a significant danger to life. Now, in 2008, First Minister, when you were the Cabinet Secretary for Health, you said the Scottish Government's policy is clear. Traditional accident and emergency ambulances should be double crewed with at least one member being a paramedic, unless there are exceptional circumstances. In too many instances, you went on to say, particularly in the Highlands, that practice is not living up to the, po the policy is not living up to the practice. It is clear after 14 years of inactivity, you have failed. Would you explain to my constituents why you have failed and when single crewed ambulances will be consigned to history? First Minister. I'm, I'm genuinely not sure that Edward Mountain listened to the, the no. answer to the first really? question. Uh, the commitment that was made in 2008, which I remember uh, very well because I was Health Secretary at the time, and at that time the instance of single crewing uh, was significant, particularly in rural areas. And the commitment we made then to supporting the ambulance service with funding to eliminate the requirement uh, for rostered single crewing, uh, particularly in remote and rural parts of the country, uh, was achieved with single crewing now only taking place in exceptional circumstances that cannot be avoided. 1.72% uh, of shifts were single crewed in the six months uh, that I have been asked about and have talked about today, less than 2%. And let me explain uh, to Mr Mountain's constituents 
constituents uh, why that is the case. If uh, there is at the last minute uh, a situation where a member of staff is ill and doesn't turn up to work, uh, for example, uh, as happens in any walk of life, the only alternative uh, to single crewing would be not to have a crew at all uh, and not to have the ambulance on shift. Uh, so it is only in those exceptional circumstances and less than 2% effectively in any national health service it does amount to eliminating uh, single crewing and health boards, uh, sorry, the Scottish Ambulance Service continues to work to minimise that figure as much as possible. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on whether it will instruct Scottish Water to freeze water rates for 2023-24 to help with the cost of living crisis. First Minister. Decisions on the levels of water charges are matters for Scottish Water's board. Uh, their decision must be taken with due regard to the principles of charging for water services set by Scottish ministers, including the key principle of affordability. Uh, the board took a responsible view last year and held charges to a real terms freeze. We expect them to again take a proportionate position balancing affordability with critical investment needs to protect the quality of our drinking water and the environment. Of course, the average water charge in Scotland remains lower than the average charge in England and Wales, but we are committed to supporting people facing any issues uh, with paying their water bills, which is why, as part of our overall package of cost of living measures, we have increased the maximum level of the water charges reduction scheme discount from 25% to 35%. Jackie Bailey. Um, last year, inflation was running at about under the formula agreed by Scottish Water and this government, water rates are charged at CPI plus 2%. Last year, the Scottish Government intervened and held water rates down, which is welcome. But this year, inflation is at 11%. The cost of water bills are set to increase by an eye-watering 13%. With an acute cost of living crisis, the worst in many decades, will the Scottish Government freeze water bills for the next financial year? First Minister, you have the power to do this. You intervened last year. The question is, do you have the political will? First Minister. Um, this is obviously a matter uh, for Scottish Water's board. As I, I said in my original answer, the, the board of Scottish Water... Uh, took a responsible decision last year and we would expect them to do the same this year uh, and to recognise absolutely the cost of living pressures uh, which remain very intense and acute. But we also expect uh, and require Scottish Water uh, to discharge other responsibilities to make sure we have a well-maintained water system so that the quality of our water services is high and it is mindful of its wider obligations to the environment. If we didn't have proper investment in our water infrastructure um, and the quality of our drinking water declined as a result, I'm sure Jackie Bailey would be one of the first uh, pointing fingers at this government. So we'll continue to take the responsible decisions, presiding officer, on this issue uh, across the range of other ways we are supporting people through the cost of living crisis. Uh, the actions and the decisions of this government uh, that continues to see us retain very high levels of trust from the Scottish people. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. Richard Hughes, chair of the Office for Budget Responsibility, has said that the last three Westminster Tory government's fiscal policy U-turns have cost taxpayers more than £40 billion of extra debt in just six months. That's £600 for every man, woman and child in the UK and 2,000 times the estimated cost of an independence referendum that the Tories keep moaning about. <laughs> Does the First Minister believe it's acceptable for the people of Scotland to continue paying the price of Westminster's economic incompetence? First Minister. No, uh, no it's not acceptable. The, the cost of Tory uh, fiscal an economic in incompetence epitomised in the disastrous decisions in the mini-budget. Remember uh, the decisions that initially the Conservatives here in yep. Scotland wanted this yep. government yep. to replicate. Uh, those decisions, coupled of course uh, with the disaster of Brexit that unfolds on a daily yep. basis, the cost of all of that has been paid by individuals, businesses and households right across Scotland right now. Um, there is an alternative to that, uh, and it's to make this Parliament responsible uh, for the decisions uh, that are so badly, being so badly mishandled at, at Westminster. Uh, and I think uh, there is a growing desire on the part of people of Scotland to become independent and to build a much better alternative uh, to what we have right now. Yeah. Donald Cameron. 
Um, at, at the weekend, the Sunday Post revealed that in the last 15 years, almost £100 million has been spent on short-term repairs to the A83 Rest and Be Thankful. Meanwhile, communities across Argyle remain exasperated by the lack of action since Transport Scotland announced its preferred permanent route last year. Will the First Minister now instruct Transport Scotland to select this route and make it a top priority to deliver and end, once and for all, the misery that closures of this road cause? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm assuming the member is not suggesting uh, that the investments in temporary repairs uh, shouldn't uh, have been made. That would be my first point. Secondly, uh, as I'm sure uh, the member uh, knows in relation to the rest and be thankful, a preferred root corridor for a permanent solution was uh, announced back in 2021. Route option designs within the preferred corridor are being progressed and we're working towards announcing a preferred route for the long-term solution by spring next year. Foyle Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the tragic death of Aov Ishak in Rochdale due to mouldy housing. I currently have constituents contacting me about issues with uh, mould and substandard temporary housing which could pose a similar threat to human life, particularly for small children. This issue seems alarmingly common across the local authority boundaries in a variety of different housing stock. What the Scottish Government doing to ensure that similar tragedies are not going to happen in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government continues uh, to invest significantly in housing, both in terms of our target for new affordable housing, but also, uh, as the Member uh, alludes to, uh, our existing housing stock. I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to write to the Member in more detail about the actions we are taking and any uh, lessons uh, that do require to be learned here in Scotland from the very tragic case uh, that the Member has highlighted today. Julian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday we saw the very welcome ruling from the Supreme Court on the Safe Access Zones Bill in Northern Ireland. The judgment was unanimous and unequivocal and I believe gives a clear way forward for safe access zones here in Scotland. Would the First Minister join me in congratulating Claire Bailey and her team on this victory? And would the First Minister give her response to the ruling and what she believes this now means for Scotland? First Minister. Uh, firstly, I would congratulate Claire Bailey, but also thank her uh, for the advice she has offered to the Scottish Government. She attended the summit uh, that uh, we held earlier this year and that Jilly Mackay uh, also attended. Uh, I was very pleased yesterday to see that the Supreme Court has protected the rights of women to access abortion services without fear of harassment or intimidation in Northern Ireland. Uh, the Scottish Government is currently uh, considering very carefully uh, the detail of that judgment and we look forward to working with Gillian Mackay on how we can progress uh, quickly the next steps for taking her bill forward. Uh, we are absolutely committed to supporting Gillian Mackay with the development of a bill to safeguard access for women in Scotland to access healthcare facilities that provide abortion services and to do so without fear, harassment or intimidation. Natalie Dawn. Recent analysis from Citizens Advice Scotland has found that half of Scots are being forced to cut back on household spending. The main levers to address this crisis reside in Westminster, an institution which cannot be trusted to concern itself with the plight of ordinary people. Can I ask the First Minister what conversation she has had with the Prime Minister regarding the inadequacy of the UK government response to the crisis that they created? First Minister. When I met with the Prime Minister um, a couple of weeks ago, I urged him, um, as the Scottish Government does more generally uh, on a regular basis, to take more action to help people uh, who are really struggling with the basic necessities of life because of this cost of living crisis. It continues to affect the livelihoods and the lives and increasingly the health and well-being of people across the country. Uh, the key policy levers are held by the UK Government, so we will continue to press them to use all levers at its disposal to tackle this emergency. That includes uh, access to borrowing, providing uh, benefits and support to households. But we will also continue to take action uh, ourselves. Uh, we've allocated almost three billion in this financial year to help. Um, and of course, we have increased the Scottish child payment uh, by 150% in less than eight months to 25 pounds per eligible child per week. Russell Finlay.
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Rhys Bonner is described as a gentle giant by his mum, Steph. He was found dead in Marshland in Glasgow in 2019. Police Scotland said his death was fully investigated, but his family disagree. In the last week, three and a half years since losing her son, some of Steph's complaints were upheld, with Perk asking Police Scotland to conduct new inquiries and provide more information. Steph tells me she is tormented by a process she describes as cruel. First Minister, it's been two years since the Angelini report laid bare the SNP's broken police complaint system. How many more families have to suffer before you or your Justice Secretary fixes it? First Minister. Um, in terms of the police complaint system, of course, uh, we are uh, taking forward recommendations from the Angelini uh, report and indeed uh, will legislate uh, in respect uh, of those recommendations. Uh, in terms of the specific case, it, it wouldn't be uh, right or appropriate for me to comment in detail on that. But of course, uh, the police uh, are expected to respond uh, to any uh, recommendations or actions that they're instructed to take uh, by PERC. And I would expect that to be the case uh, here. But that broader uh, reform of the complaint system uh, is ongoing and underway. And the Justice Secretary will keep Parliament updated as appropriate. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The BBC reported this week that the backlog of community payback orders has reached 700,000. That's on top of the quarter of a million that were written off during the pandemic. The Justice Secretary told the BBC that this was pretty much business as usual. With respect, First Minister, if you're a victim of crime, this is anything but business as usual. And that includes a domestic abuse victim who saw her offender walk free from court with unpaid hours as his sentence. She was punched in the face, she was chucked through a glass door, and she is scarred and traumatised for life. The justice system is letting people down, it is letting women down, and community payback orders are not even being served, First Minister. When will this end, and when will the community justice system actually serve justice for victims of crime? First Minister. First thing. Presiding officer, obviously uh, the, the kind of individual cases uh, that Jamie Green has narrated uh, you know, are, are always uh, difficult and unacceptable for the individuals uh, concerned. Uh, more generally, however, as I often say here, because it is absolutely right that I do so, uh, court decisions are for courts and it is not uh, for ministers uh, or any politicians uh, to intervene in decisions of our justice system where a community payback order is issued, of course, uh, the offender has to serve uh, that community payback uh, order, and that remains the case. More generally, of course, our community justice system uh, performs well, um, which will be one of the reasons why we continue to see uh, levels of crime in this country at historically low uh, levels and re-offending rates reduce as well. Uh, we continue to support the justice system to recover uh, from the pandemic and to catch up on backlogs uh, in all different aspects of the system. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. <clears throat> Point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'd like to seek your guidance on the procedures surrounding the correcting of the official report. I have here a letter that I received last night from Sir Robert Choate, who is the chair of the UK Statistics Authority. After I alerted the authority, it, was the, it has investigated the SNP and Green government's claim that Scotland has 25% of Europe's potential offshore wind resource. Sir Robert confirms that these figures are in fact a mashup of several different studies that are more than 20 years old. He confirms that the Scottish government's calculations exclude countries like Norway, Sweden and Finland, which have large offshore wind potential. And he confirms that the figures give an inflated picture and were always inaccurate. The letter specifically says, and I quote, on 15th November, the Minister for Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity, Lorna Slater, Scottish Greens, acknowledged in Holyrood that the figure was outdated, but not that it was poorly constructed. In other words, it was never true. And it is time for the SNP and Greens to give up the spin and admit that. The First Minister's spokespeople still insist that it was, and I quote, calculated accurately at the time, not true. Um, Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero, has even written to me this morning to say the figure is dated, not true. And it is still on SNP leaflets going through people's doors. The authority is now contacting the Scottish National Party and a number of nationalist parliamentarians directly about this. Now, I fully support 
the expansion of Scotland's renewable sector. I can't believe that Michael Matheson is actually leaving the chamber at this stage, presiding officer. I, I find that very disrespectful. I fully support the expansion of Scotland's renewable sector, but the strong case for that is undermined when the Scottish Government, and the SNP in particular, use figures that are completely fictitious. This, government's guidance, sorry, this Parliament's guidance states that corrections can only be accepted within 20 working days. Can I therefore seek your guidance on whether you have been approached by Lorna Slater, presiding officer, about her statement to Parliament on the 15th of November? Do you, presiding officer, expect a correction to be lodged before the 20-day deadline expires next Tuesday? Because I am concerned that Parliament has been misled. Thank, I, 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 can I re respond to Mr. Cole, Cole Hamilton? Um, it is of paramount importance that members, including ministers, give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any errors at the earliest opportunity. If a member has a question about the factual accuracy of another member's contribution, they should raise it with that member. The Chamber and the member will be aware that the Parliament has previously agreed a corrections mechanism and how that mechanism operates. To answer your question, I have not been approached by the Minister, but it is entirely a matter for members to decide whether and how to use the corrections procedure. First Minister. Further point of order to that, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, as Ministers have said, uh, that figure is uh, no longer appropriate to use because it is out of date. But let me think, I, I think Alex Cole... I think Alex Cole Hamilton uh, would want me to put a complete picture before this chamber. Uh, so there are statements that he didn't include in his point of order. I'll give two. Uh, Scotland has a major role to play in this with an estimated 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential. That was a statement from uh, Lib Dem Minister Michael oh. Moore. Um, or secondly, we have more offshore wind power than the rest of the world combined. That was Lib Dem leader Vince Cable. Oh. Uh, so if it is the case that Alec Cole Hamilton um, is so distressed at the use of that figure by Scottish Government Ministers, perhaps in the interest of completeness, uh, he would also refer to his own colleagues who used exactly the same figure. The fact of the matter is we have massive renewable potential and that is what Alec Cole Hamilton does not like. Thank you, First Minister. That was not a point of order. Your comments are, however, on the record. Point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. Order. Um, I seek your clarification around correction of the official report um, because I believe the First Minister has once again trotted out the suggestion that whilst that statistic is, no, she, in her words, no longer accurate, Presiding Officer, the UK Statistical Authority wrote to me yesterday to say that it was never accurate, and frankly, I find that broadside attack on me personally beneath her. Mr Cole Hamilton, I have responded to your point of order. I have made it quite clear and members should make themselves aware as to how the corrections mechanism operates. Thank you. <laughs> we will shortly move on to members' business. What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. 
Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it.